first problem was whenever I tried to remember or repeat the title for this evening to a friend, I would say, I'm going to be in the House of Speakeasy series at Joe's Pub, and the theme is, I'm not you. <laughs> so, I'm not you. I would chastise and correct myself, and I would keep doing it. So, finally, in the spirit of psychological inquiry, we can call it surveillance of Freudian slippage, I decided that I was going to go with them both. Okay. Now, I started my writing life as a critic, but was I a critic or a reviewer? I think we both know that the distinction between the two can cause acute gravitas anxiety. <laughs> so, you are both. That's what I reassured myself. Um, I was also a cluster of nouns and adjectives that kept trading places. I was a black critic, I was a woman critic, and often, depending on the setting, I was the first black, the first woman, or the first black woman critic. What, what unified all these was critical authority. It was the armature of published judgment. That's not altogether you. <laughs> it's definitely not. It's the institution you work for. I did know that. And um, I'm going to go Janet Malcolm on us all for a minute. Just a little appropriation. Let me get it right. Every critic who is not stupid, <laughs> every critic who is not stupid um, or full of himself, who is not so stupid or full of himself that he does not notice what is going on, knows that what he does, while not morally indefensible, does engender and promote um, a distasteful form of omniscient narrator hubris. <laughs> I did know this, and eventually I came to tire of it. I, I thought that it would be interesting. No, I thought that I needed to try to write from ambivalence and vulnerability and see if they yielded some kind of authority. And I also wanted to write through and about the kind of passion you can feel for an artist or an art form that leaves you always kind of uncertain and exposed it really is if it were unrequited love. So, behold my consummate subject, Michael Jackson. Yes. <laughs> he was everywhere. He was voraciously ingesting this look and that style. He was flaunting all of these sexual tropes and, and gender threats. He was, he was like, a laboratory, a human laboratory of mutations, and all these secrets that we were never going to know, that we are never going to know. Um, but he died, and I lived. What to write next? Margot, I told myself, memoir is so not you. I said it firmly, I said it calmly, I said it with that, that kind of cheap irony that you hope will disguise brute fear. And I did say it in despair to myself. This memoir can never be you. Uh, everything in my upbringing had taught me I was not to, I should not write memoir. Now, we always um, are telling our writer friends and our writing students, oh, you know, use what you have. <laughs> use the material you've got. Now, what was I supposed to do with that? <laughs> Nothing in my background um, encouraged, led, um, or even I often felt it would allow me to write memoir. Memoir, um, it shows you off and it shows you up, too. Um, and in the world I grew up in, this was not considered appropriate. Uh, a good Negro girl uh, was supposed to represent her race and her sex, her people. 
um, at their distinguished, accomplished best. You notice I'm now folding my hands in that discreet way we once did. She does not show off, no, she does not show off, and she does not confess weakness unless it's a stepping stone to victory, the triumph narrative. Uh, I was raised in Negro land to be, or I was taught I should be um, outstanding, but modest, proud, and forbearing, um, ambitious, but decorous. Uh, yes, um, I was also taught that class would make me universal enough so that I could cross most boundaries of race and gender. The apparatus of class, the accoutrement of class, um, they would do it. Um, I now realize that um, I was actually taught to show off by not seeming to. And this is the good taste version of showing off, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, even after I had actually started to work on the, or, or my, memoir, whenever people would ask what I was working on, I would struggle and, and often almost babble. Um, I would then practice a, a brief, brisk, clear description with a friend, and in the moment, I would flub or just kind of maim or rush my lines. I would say something like, well, I'm writing about um, the world I grew up in, which is variously called and has called itself. Um, W.E.B. Du Bois called us the talented 10th. Du Bois was my black history validator, right? Um, and we have been called, and we have called ourselves um, over a couple of centuries, over time, um, the colored elite, the Negro aristocracy, the black upper class, the black bourgeoisie, and here came my black leftist bona fides, a bunch of bougie blacks. <laughs> I was desperate to parry criticism and to deflect um, any kind of expectation that I felt would be burdensome or censorious. Well, fool said my muse, look in your heart and write. Um, this is actually a very good um, credo for a memoirist. And if your heart is kind of like um, a multiplex with a different show going on in every chamber, well, <laughs> you perform. <laughs> and as the critic, you watch the performers and the performance. So I um, kept writing. And one day, I um, wrote this. I wrote. Um, in Negro land, we thought of ourselves as the third race, poised between the masses of blacks and all classes of Caucasians. Like the third eye, the third race, we thought, um, had an intuition, a wisdom, an enlightened knowledge that the other two races lacked. We had education, we had sophistication, and we had standardized verbal dexterity. And if, as was said by many, we ached and longed and strove to be white. And if, as was said, we boasted over much of uh, the white blood, the, le sang de blanc, as New Orleanians like to call it, that coursed or ran or trickled lightly through our veins, um, if we placed too high a value on the the manners and the looks and the morals that were called the Anglo-Saxon birthright, white people wanted to be white just as much as we did. Yes, they tried just as hard and they failed just as often. They failed more often, but they could pass, so no one objected. It's not you, <laughs> but it is you. I'm not you, mm, I am you. Uh, once I stopped resisting so much these um, vacillations and oscillations and contradictions and such, uh, I found that the best way to write was piecemeal. 
bits here, bits there, um, stories and anecdotes and scenes, non-sequential, just written and gathered and collected out of sequence. Um, I would, I started to, in fact, um, change pronouns and tenses and personae. Um, no single narrative voice it revealed itself was true, um, was accurate, was a rendering um, of this world, which was so full of rehearsals and performances and strategies. Uh, so I would uh, try all kinds of things I had not really done um, in my criticism. I historicized, I confessed. Confession is very cold sweat making. Um, I analyzed. I that I could do. I was a critic, and I meditated. Um, there's always kind of gravitas in meditation, isn't there? Um, and I realized, too, as the material collected, that um, there wasn't, well, that every time I tried too hard or too early to fix a structure, you, know, you, you wake up often as a writer and you're like, this, I've got it. I had this vision in the wee small hours of the morning. This is going to work. Every time I would do that in that fixed, omniscient narrator way, it worked like a prohibition. It would get in the way. Um, so I said, all right, go with it again. You, know, you will find the structure. It will start to reveal itself. You will start working with what's emerging. When I did, finally find it, um, after many efforts, it was not um, a long line structure with an arc. Um, it was a forced march to the fragmented outcome. And when the book was done at last, at last and at last, and revised and published and when I'd read it and reread it and such, um, I realized, or I could say, and I can say now, um, this memoir, it's, it's not you, Margo. It's your present negotiating with versions of your past for a future you'll be willing to live in. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.